Hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to We Are the Overcomers. And we have another message for you today. I'm hoping that you will be able to come in as soon as you receive the notification. Ah, uh, 7-Eleven right now as I'm looking at it. OK, uh, what I want to do is I want to discuss with you today. Ah, thank you, Sister Paulette. Thank you for, for being here. Please come on in, everyone. I, I believe we're going to have a, a nice message today, and I want to follow along, excuse me, with uh, several things that I believe that we have that are about to quickly come to pass. And uh, so am I setting a date? No. Am I watching a date? You betcha. And I think this is something that we really need to be looking at very strongly. One, because Jesus told us to watch, okay? And watching means absolutely doing that. It doesn't mean some kind of casual in the back of your mind. You go like, yeah, that might be something worth looking at. No, 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 no. He actually, hello, Donna, how are you doing, sister? Uh, everyone else, like I said, come on in. I'm going to uh, try to get into this at a deeper level. So I'm not going to be looking too much at the uh, chat bar. So please uh, just uh, talk to everyone and, uh, and amongst yourselves and, and be able to discuss what we're going to talk about here today. Uh, as you can see from the uh, the title, one of the several, we're going to discuss several things today. We're going to discuss the number 37. And I remember that, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit of an oldster. So that's going to kind of bring up these old ideas. When, when I was a kid, uh, we had this show. I, I believe that they, they, it stopped a little while ago, but uh, called Sesame Street. And on Sesame Street, they, they would always say, and this is brought to you by the number 37. And, you know, that type of thing. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the number 37 and how important that is actually to us today, right at this very moment, because I'm going to show you a lot about numbers, and specifically that number 37. But I also want to caveat this and say, there's, there, first off, God himself, if you are a member of the family, your Abba, your heavenly dad, is the creator of numbers. And uh, just like he's the creator of all things, Jesus, our uh, glorious bridegroom, he has created them to show us in every possible uh, area of our lives that it's all about him. It's all about him. And so we're going to discuss that. And then I'm going to segue that, hopefully, well, into discussing about uh, I'm going to discuss the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's going to relate to, believe it or not, I believe that we're going to be able to show you about the three harvests. Now, stick with me. I know that there's 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 a, a bunch of folks that just have trouble with this, but more and more are starting to be enlightened and have the revelation of there actually being three different harvests or three different rapture events, if you will. I prefer to call them harvest because it fits under the harvest model that is so prevalent throughout the Bible, throughout our Holy Scripture. So we're going to discuss uh, about that, and we're going to discuss about Enoch, Pentecost, and Dr. Barry. 
Okay, uh, he just came out with a, a second uh, part of his three-part series. If you haven't seen that, please, please go check out Dr. Barry's uh, version, his, his latest video, because he covers so much, and uh, I, I really love him. And, and while all of the watchmen and women are have slight differences in how we approach in the greater umbrella or overarching picture, we are coming to be on the same page, if you will, okay? And so this is one of the things we're going to discuss uh, and discuss where I am still leaning towards the barley harvest. And I'm going to show you that, but that the three parts, the three harvests, why do we see a rapture picture in all of these different appointed times? Here is my submission to you. We see a rapture in them because there is a rapture in them, okay? that That's what I'm going to do. We're going to go into this in deep detail, okay? So first, before we do that, let's say a quick prayer because I certainly want Holy Spirit to be the one who leads this, okay? This, this is his word. This is his message. We want to give our God all the glory, the praise, and the honor, and lift him up for what he has done and what he is doing and what he will do. Amen? All right. Our oh, dear Heavenly Father, our Abba, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. There are not enough words that we can say to express our love, our adoration, our worship, our, our focus, our desire to know you, to be with you, to experience your fullness in our lives. And I am just asking that you, Holy Spirit, that you're going to work through this message, that you're going to give me the words to speak, that's going to have that impact, that's going to help to draw those, that's going to encourage your family, that's going to draw those through your word, those that are not yet a part of the family, you are going to draw them here today because the time is short and you're about to Open up the sky, Jesus, and to call up your bride. And I want me, and I'm hope, and I know that your heart as well, that you want every single person that's a member of that bride to be ready to go. And let this be the the the, the moment that we can say that, that that everyone is going to be focused on that, and they are not going to be asleep any longer. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, the one who has spilled his precious blood for us, for us all, and that we can receive that as a free gift. We thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's, oh my goodness, there is so much. So let me start with this. Let me start with this, actually. Mm. All right. Thank you, Abba. You will notice that I have a jacket on, a vest. Why? Well, because I'm here in Australia and we are starting into winter. And that's one of the interesting things. Uh, if if uh, many of you who have followed the messages and the, the God dreams that I have had, I stand by them because that I have really checked, uh, uh, received confirmation. Now, having said that, I have also received confirmation when there has been the attempt of the enemy to try to uh, put uh, dreams that are not of God uh, to have me do those. Now, I am not going to do those. Those are, this is all about God and his message and what he's trying to do. Amen. So what I'm trying to say is that from the last thing I was going like, he's going to come 
in the winter. And um, that's, that's what I got from this. Excuse me, in several instances, that's what that's had. And I still stood by that. But one of the things I did not know and I was unsure about, and I'm, I'm still not, uh, you know, exactly, I, I'm a little more sure than I was, but I did not know which winter are we talking about. And when I say which winter, I mean based on what part of the world, the globe. Yes, the round globe, folks. Which part of the globe in that winter is this what I'm being shown? Now, the reason I say that is because I'm in Australia. And uh, and so right now, like I said, it's 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 cold. That's why I'm wearing a jacket, folks. Uh, got the heater going on high and uh, and it's chilly outside. Uh, but I was unsure about whether or not, because I actually am an American, uh, and so was that being shown from the standpoint of winter in the US, for example, or in the Northern Hemisphere, as I'm trying to say. And, uh, and what I have come to, I guess, kind of pull together is, the answer to that question is, Yes. And by that, I mean, yes, in both instances. So here we are, we're, we're actually in uh, spring in the Northern Hemisphere and, uh, and going closely, we'll be going into the summer. Uh, but here we're in the, the winter here and this kind of this overlap of the seasons, if you will, because we know that in Israel, there's only two seasons, right? Summer and winter. And what's interesting is we're going to look at how Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, that's going to be one of the things we talk about in detail, uh, is actually the end of the winter and then starting of the summer wheat harvest. Okay. All right. So we're going to cover all of these things. And how can we look at that? What, how do we look at the last day? What does that last day mean? Uh, is there a barley harvest? No. Does that relate to someone else? Is there a wheat harvest? No. Does that relate to someone else? Is there a fruit harvest? No. You see the, all of those. And so what I'm trying to say is yes in all three instances. That's what I'm saying. Let's get into this. All right, let's start with numbers. I have been barraged by numbers now. It almost seemed like it initially last year, it would start as a trickle. You know, I would have a number appear here or a number appear there. <coughs> Excuse me. But it started picking up. And as it gets to the point that we're talking to today, I am getting multiple number uh, numbers that I'm focused on seeing that I that my attention is like bang there's a number bang there's a number and they all have this biblical significance right and at least from me what I'm talking about is how it relates to me now I'm just going to show you a quick snapshot. Okay, so we're going to have a lot of snapshots today. Uh, uh, Dr. Barry has got it to where he now has everything popping up on the screen with him. I haven't got to that stage yet in how I can do this in live. So I'm still going to stick with the, the, the paper picture in front of the camera approach. Okay, so let's work with it this way. I'm just going to show you a quick snapshot of numbers that I had had show up while I was on my iPad. This is just from my iPad. It's from nothing else. And there are so many that it would take me several messages to kind of show you them all. But I'm just going to give you a sampling here at the very end to kind of give you an idea, right? 
So this is out of my picture list, okay? I'm going to show you here, and you can just take a, uh, a shot of that so you can see it, okay? All right. So what I'm going to show, what I'm going to uh, cover here is that there are multiple numbers that you can see, uh, and it read forwards or backwards, right? Whether we're uh, looking at it from the English standpoint or maybe the Hebrew standpoint, okay? And you can see uh, triple numbers. You can see countdowns, uh, such as, uh, so you can see multiple times. And 153, I, I am just like multiple times a day. I'm, I'm still getting this. You can see... Uh, uh, where I've got uh, like 111, which actually would turn out, uh, I've got 1111, 726 for Harpazo, 711 for the, the judgment, the flood, the, uh, you can see 444, 444, 444. I'm seeing that a lot, but I'm seeing all of the numbers. You can see 222, I've got 333, 555. We've got countdowns, you, you can see 321. We, all of these, uh, 717, and you go like, what is that? Well, in strong, 717, that means to pluck, pluck up, right? It's the it's in the same lines of 726, which is the harpazo, right? So what I'm trying to say is there are so many numbers, and the numbers 111, 222, 333, 444, 555, and so on and so forth. And I was going like, why am I seeing all of that now? And so often, why? I did not know why. So I prayed about it. And I was shown. You know what? This, brothers and sisters, I hope that you are going to find this so encouraging. And why do we see this? I'm going to show you what I, I found here. Uh, from uh, There are several uh, websites that I get a lot of information that, that I'm able to call and try to pull together these, these messages. But uh, the, the livingword.org.au, uh, that's, that's uh, if, you, if you haven't, subscribe and there is so much good stuff there. I, I just really would like to point that out. And that's the livingword.org.au. Well, of course, .au because that's an Australian site and that's just one of the ones that I look at. So anyway, let's take a look at this. Take a snapshot of this. Awesome, 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 okay? Now, I'm going to, this is the beauty of numbers, all right? And you can see every single 111, 222, 333, 444, 555, 666, 777, and 888, and 999. So if you are seeing these numbers and you're thinking like, what do they mean? Well, what you can see from here is they all mean 37. 37, and you, you go like, well, that's great, Wayne. What does 37 mean? And what 37 means is Jesus, okay? I'm going to, I'm going to tell you that, and this is what we're going to, we've got so many of these things, so many of these, and I'm, I'm going to highlight this. So I've got this out of the uh, living word, .org.au, as I mentioned, and so I'm going to, this is one part here, and I want you to get a snapshot of this, okay? Now, this is just one little thing that we've got here, and we highlight the significance. He's got uh, videos on this and downloadable uh, uh, sheets such as this one as an example, that discusses the number 37 throughout the Bible. And so I've highlighted just a couple here to just focus on the point that we have here. And that is the name of Jesus is the number one. And the gematria value 
from the numbers. So if, if you're not aware, both in Hebrew and Greek, every one of their letters has a, a number value. And so the, the way that the numbers uh, add up or calculated and multiplied and divided, all these different things reveals this intricacy and, and detail from a mathematical side that only the creator God could do. And that's what we see here. So I wanna focus on this 37. And uh, we can see that the name of Jesus in Greek is Jesus, right? And the value of that in the Greek is 888, as many of you know. Well, what does that factor to? Well, it factors to 37 times 24. That's the name for Jesus. How about Christ, Christos in Greek? That is the uh, value of 1480. Great, 1480. What does that mean? That means 37 times 40. That's the number there. What about the number for God, right? Um, and as our deity, as we know it, as listed out of Colossians 2, verse 9. Well, that number is 962, 962. Great, what is that? That factors down into 37 times 26, okay? And so many, many more, right? Uh, and, and I encourage you to check that out and download that. It's so many interesting things. Well, I'm going to take this. I'm not gonna cover more than that. I just encourage you to check out the livingword.org.au. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into some narrative right now on the number 37. OK. All right. And we're going to discuss where we see that. And we're going to go into a deeper detail. And I'm going to segue this into the three harvest rapture events. And we're going to see that up. that's where I'm just going with this. And why the number 37, why these numbers that we're seeing, the reason why they are so prevalent is because it's pointing to that very event, okay? All right, so let's look at the way we can see these from a different perspective. Now, this is a, a gentleman named Norm uh, Pat Patrickwin. Uh, I'm, I'm probably butchering that, I do apologize, but uh, it was from a, a, a website entitled Amazing Word, okay? And so there are several different things here. He's discussing the number 37 from a different perspective, but I wanted to give that perspective. So I wanted to go ahead and read that so that you can think like, wow, it is so, there's so many different ways, so many different contact points, if you will, just on this number 37. So let's read about that. It says God's number 37 is a theme that tells of per uh, perfection, sanctification, and being saved. But I'm going to go one step farther because he also points out without realizing that it means being lifted out which we can see, wait a minute, if we're lifted out of something, isn't that what the harpazo is? Isn't that what the rapture event is? Let's discuss this in detail, all right? He says, when you see anything related to number 37 and its reverse, 73, right? So that's, that's what we're seeing. So when you see 73, it really is 37, right? Think about the number, 777. Seven, seven. Now, remember, I just showed you how that relates to 37 anyway, right? But 777, seven, seven, three times, uh, three sevens, right? That's where he's coming up from it. That's the perspective he's looking at, meaning perfection, sanctification, consecration, truth, and Jesus. 
which we know that Jesus is the truth, right? He's the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? 37 can be seen like three sevens, which has similar meaning. Examples speak for themselves and should make you wonder about this impossible claim. The 3700th verse of the Bible finds the Lord selecting the Levites to be the tribe of priests who are to be holy and set apart for serving God. Not coincidentally, this is also the third chapter and the seventh verse, 37, of the book of Numbers. This is just one of the Bible's many examples showing how number 37 is related to being saved, slashed, raised up. Ah, there we've got it. Uh, or, or being holy or perfect. Like all God's numbers, opposite meanings can also be found associated with them. So with the number 37, you will also find themes of not being saved or being defeated or destroyed, right? All right, one very compelling example of the consistent theme uh, associated with number 37 are the contents of the seven chapter 37s of the Bible. Each of these chapters speak of being saved, made perfect, lifted up, or opposite themes such as being thrown down or not being saved. It seems no coincidence that there happen to be seven chapter 37s. So here's the chapters that he picks out, or well, that he doesn't pick out, that are the chapter 37s. So first, we start with Genesis chapter 37. Joseph thrown down into a pit, but he is lifted up out of it. And I want to focus on that. Thank you, you know, there's the big flag. Ding, 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 ding. All right. Exodus chapter 37 perfection of the furniture of the tabernacle, things of pure gold, made perfect, anointing oil. Job 37, God comes down. We cannot comprehend a perfect God. The 13,777th Bible verse is Job 37, verse 7. He seals the hand of every man. How about Psalms 37? The Lord will save his people. Psalm 37, verse 37 says, Mark the blameless man. That's the person who is saved. Isaiah 37, God will save Jerusalem. The 733rd verse of Isaiah, which is Isaiah 37, verse 35. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake, and for my servant David's sake. And we're going to get more into David here in just a little bit and the 37, okay? And I think that you're going to like that because that's going to relate to what I'm going to be going into, the three rapture events, okay? All right, Jeremiah 37. Jerusalem was saved when the siege was lifted, and Jeremiah was also saved from death in Jeremiah 37, verse 21. King Zedekiah commanded, they commit Jeremiah to the court of the guardhouse and gave him a loaf of bread daily. Interestingly, there's C37 times verse 21, which is 777, chapter 37 times verse 21 out of Jeremiah 37, 21. Both numbers reflect three sevens. How about Ezekiel 37? That's the Valley of Dry Bones. The Dry Bones vision of Israel who will be saved. Ezekiel 37, verse 28. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Now, he finishes off by saying this. I know how impossible this all sounds, but consider in the 777th Bible chapter, which is Jeremiah 32, 27, says, excuse me, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. 
is anything too difficult for me? And the 37th verse of Luke, which is Luke 1, verse 37, says, for nothing will be impossible with God. Don't be surprised when you see that God has done the impossible. Amen. Like God, his numbers and the Bible's perfection are beyond our comprehension. And again, I say, amen. Now let's take a look at what it's, it's just, oh, Holy Spirit. I feel, I feel the Holy Spirit right now. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I'm covered with this. We are going to discuss number 37 and King David. And where are we going to discuss this out of, right? We are going to start by discussing this out of First Chronicles 11.11, 11. okay? There's another one. Bing! How many times have we seen 11.11? 11? Okay, I want you to highlight this. King David attracted many fierce fighters during his lifetime. These were men who fought for David, for King David. The greatest of these, a special set of 37 elite warriors were known as his, quote, mighty men. And that's what we get out of 1 Chronicles 11.11, 11, okay? They were heroic commandos who had distinguished themselves on the battlefield. And that's in 1 Chronicles 11 and 2 Samuel, verse 23, or excuse me, chapter 23. Within David's group of 37 elite fighters were three subgroups, and that should make you perk up, three groups, okay? The first was composed of three men. This is the first. That was uh, Jashobim, Eliezer, and Shammah, who were the best of the best out of these 37. They were known as the three mighties in 1 Chronicles 11, verse 12. The three mighties. They were the ones that were the closest to the strongest of the warriors that were closest to King David. Now, I want you to also consider that King David is a symbol of Jesus, okay? As we look at these three groups that are warriors for him, these elite ones that were selected out, and they are the number 37, right? All right. The second subgroup of David's warriors was composed of two men who were valiant in battle, but not quite as noteworthy as the three mighties. Now, this is in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 18 through 23. Now, this third subgroup numbered 32 individuals known for their war skills. Now, you see how we have the, the three mighties. Those are the closest ones, the, the, the ones that are there, the, the, the strong, mighty warriors with David next to him. And then you've got one that's next down, and they're, they're close, but that they're, they're not like the three mighties. And then the, the other ones, they're known for their warrior skills, uh, but they are unnamed. One of the interesting facts about David's 37 mighty men is that they weren't all Israelites. Yes, that's right, brothers and sisters. There were Gentiles among the group, too. Interestingly, both Gentiles and Israelites. So which ones were Gentiles. Well, what's interesting is that Uriah, whose wife, beautiful wife Bathsheba, would lead to his death when David wanted her in 2 Samuel chapter uh, 11 and 12. He was a Hittite, Uriah the Hittite in 2 Samuel 23 verse 39 and 1 Chronicles chapter 11 verse 41. Another warrior named Zelek was an Ammonite. Uh, and uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 37, and 1 Chronicles 11, verse 39. And a third was Ithma, 
And he was a Moabite in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 46. So this, I, I just want to point that out because there are three groups. And what I want to highlight is all of these different areas that highlight these three groups. The ones that are strongest and closest to Jesus, that is going to be the first rapture group. That is going to be the barley harvest. That is going to be the mighties, the three mighties, the ones that are uh, associated the closest with Jesus. That's going to be the ones that have the heart for Jesus. That's the ones that's looking for Jesus. And so there's going to be a number of folks that say, no, 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 no. It's going, you, you're talking about, uh, which I can't believe that looking for Jesus can be considered by some as actually a work. I, in 24 different separate passages where we are commanded to watch, yet they still want to say that that is a work. Seriously? Okay, well, um, I, I disagree, and I believe that the Bible shows that he disagrees as well. But I'm not just going to say that I disagree without giving you scripture to, to be able to hold that up, okay? And in discussing that, we're also going to show you another three groups, another uh, type and shadow of these three groups, okay? All right. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight, I'm, I've borrowed a couple of um, uh, graphics that were from Dr. Barry. And so thank you, Dr. Barry. Again, please check out his, his latest. And if you haven't subscribed to him, I'm just like, why not? What's taking you so long, folks? Go ahead and subscribe to him. He's got some really good teaching. And Hopefully, just hearing this, it's going to really open you up to see things in the scripture that you haven't considered before. So that's really good. Uh, do we agree on every point? No. Do we agree on all of the main points? Yes. Okay. So that's what we want to talk about right now. So here it is. All right. And it's this particular one here. All right. If you can, let me see that. Okay. All right, so that is Matthew chapter uh, 26, verse 38 through 41. And, uh, and what is interesting, I, I, I want to highlight out of this, because this was something that really prompted me to kind of do this message, because it's really leading more and more into these three harvest, the three harvest. I really want to highlight the three harvest, right? So he says, then he saith unto them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and he fell on his face and prayed saying, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Verse 40, and he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, highlight that. Who did he say this to? To Peter, okay? He, you notice he didn't say this to all of them. Hey, all you guys, right? He said this specifically to Peter, and there's a reason. We're going to see that. Could you not watch with me for one hour. That's also big. There, there's, there's so much in that verse. So then verse 41, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. All right. Now, ah, oh, that's I hope is a good segue to what I'm going to give you now. And that is about another type and shadow of the three harvests that we get from the three synoptic gospels discussing the garden 
of Gethsemane, okay? Three groups, three harvests. Now, let me, you, you, if you've heard this from me before and then others uh, uh, before, you're going to hear that there are the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but they are written with a particular audience in mind. Are they good for all of us? Yes, absolutely. Are they instructive for all of us? Yes, absolutely. Do you get rid of any of this? No, are you kidding me? All of the scripture is God's scripture, right? It's good for reproof, instruction, the building up of the, of the man of God. Let's just go ahead and make sure that we understand what it means, however, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you the Luke passage, the Mark passage, and the Matthew passage, and I'm going to do it in this order. There's a reason for this. In the Luke passage, because Luke, as I would submit to you, is actually written to the bride, the first, the pre-tribulation harvest group that comprises the bride of Christ. So bear with me. I'm going to support everything I say to you with scripture and not just one scripture taken out of context that's supposed to hit every single thing, such as no man knows the day or the hour. Really? You're going to use that for everything that's ever said? No man knows the day or the hour? Why don't you just attach it to the verse that comes before it so that you will understand what it actually means? Let's go ahead because I'm going to give you the scriptures in their greater context, and then we're going to sink down into them to get deeper meaning. Amen? All right. So Luke is for the bride. And then Mark is for, oh, just listen to me, for the left behind church. It's for the left behind church. You can say, oh, no, no, no. There's only one rapture. My question would be, where did you find out about that one rapture? Was this a, a revelation of God to you? Or is that from you putting all of these particular things together? And then you had a uh, uh, Holy Spirit actually imparted to you and told you, yep, there's only one. Everyone else that reads any of these other parts of the Bible is wrong. I would think that that's Probably not the case, right? All right. What I'm saying is, and, and we were all at that particular point. Not all of it. I mean, I wasn't always a Christian, and I would imagine that uh, everyone that's watching this probably wasn't always a Christian. And, and hopefully there are some of you that may want to be a Christian after hearing this. But what I'm trying to say is, once there was revelation, once revelation appeared in your heart. Once you had that, that understanding, wait a minute, Jesus is God. Jesus did die for my sin debt that I can't pay. Jesus was buried and he rose again after three days. I believe that. This is all true. Jesus, save me, be my savior, enter my heart, cleanse me, cover me with your precious blood. When that happens, up to that point, you didn't believe that. But once Revelation came in and you saw that, you believed that you latched onto it, right? And that's when you start in. Well, what I'm saying is now that the book of Daniel has been unsealed and open to us in these last days, what we see is so much more being shown. So is there a big uh, umbrella event that we can see from afar off? Yes. Uh, do we see more as we get closer to it, as there is this progressive revelation, if you will, of what God through his holy word is showing us? And again, I would say yes. Okay. So Luke is for the bride. Mark is for the left behind church, which will happen in the greatest part of the church is going to be left behind. They will have a rapture and this rapture will happen at the, you know, we'll just use the middle of the tribulation just for simplicity's sake. Now, there are different people such as our 
Brother Mike, Repo Man 64, everyone say hi to him. And if you haven't seen him and you haven't uh, uh, subscribed to him, my goodness, what are you waiting for? Just like that, please. He has such good stuff. And Brother Mike, I'm going to be borrowing some of your stuff here in this teaching today that's going to relate to this. And so I really want you to, to listen and to see this and to then go and check his stuff out. It is amazing. And I just really appreciate and love our brother, Mike. And I hope that you will do the same. All right. So we've got then Mark as the left behind church. Well, what does that leave? That leaves Matthew. And that is written to the Jews. And, and so Again, does that mean that we just discard it? Don't listen to it. Don't read it. No, it is very instructive to us. But the audience that it was written to and for a purpose, which we can see, is to the Jews. Okay. Ah, thank you, Baba. Okay. So let's let's get into this. I'm going to, and the reason. Sorry, let me just say this one more thing. The reason why I'm doing this is because I want you to see the differences. Uh, some people would look at that and say, well, 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 it's just looking at it from a different perspective. Okay, well, kind of. But what I would say to you is it's not necessarily that it's written from a different perspective. It's written to a different audience. And we can see, when we look at this, we can see why, okay? Same event, different audience. Why is there apparent discrepancies or apparent contradictions? It's because it's written to a different audience. All right, so let's start. Luke chapter 22, and I'm gonna read verses 39 through 46, all right? Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. All right. Verse 40. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. Verse 41. He withdrew. Highlight these little words that you're going to see here because we're going to cover back when I and go back over them. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel appeared from heaven to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer, rose from prayer and went back to the disciples. He found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Now I'm going to stop here because we're going to have a comparison with the other ones. But I'm going to stop here because I want to highlight things. Luke, is written to the bride. And what things are we seeing here or not seeing as it were? Well, uh, we are uh, not seeing a rebuke as we're going to see in the other instances. We don't see multiple times where Jesus is coming back in this part of the narrative in Luke. And there are some other interesting things that go along with this. So let me just backtrack and we'll see what those are. Remember, this is Luke chapter 22, right? Verses 39 through 46. Now it's interesting where it says then in verse 40, Luke uh, 22 verse 40, on reaching this place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. This harkens back to just the chapter, the end of the chapter right before in Luke 21 and verse 36. And what is that verse, right? That verse says, 
Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all of these things that are coming upon the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. Now let me point out, that verse is only in Luke. It's not in the other synoptic Gospels. Why? Because it's written to the bride. The stand before the Son of Man is actually marriage language. I've done me messages on that before. Uh, and if you don't realize that, that actually comes from uh, the Exodus uh, uh, scenario where they stood uh, before God, and that's when he delivered the, uh, the marriage covenant, okay? Uh, so that's, that's where that comes from, to stand before the Son of Man. That's a marriage. That's a marriage, okay? So I want you to understand that. That comes out of Luke. So he says, pray that you will not fall into temptation, all right? And then it says, verse 41, he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. Now let's stop here for just a second. It doesn't say that he walked off. Every word that's listed in the Bible is there for a reason. And we need to dig down in here and find out what it's really saying to us. He withdrew, right? So that's what's going to happen at uh, once the, uh, the, think about this in terms of the rapture taking place. The rapture, the barley harvest bride being raptured out, and he withdraws to heaven, right? But it's interesting, he withdrew, but he withdrew how far? About a stone's throw beyond them, okay? Now, it's interesting that he writes here, a stone's throw, because what we're going to see in the other ones is he talks to Peter, and uh, specifically to Peter. And what is Peter's name? Peter's name in Greek is Petros. And you know what that is? That's a stone, a pebble. So think about this from that standpoint. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them. He what they, this group was taken beyond withdrew with this one group beyond about uh, beyond where Peter was. If you're following me, you can start to see this connection here. You will as we read more of this, okay? And, uh, and so then what's interesting is in this instance, and it's the only one where there is an angel that comes from heaven down, right? Now, it's to strengthen Jesus out of this, but we can see certain parallels again, right? So, all right. And then when Jesus rises in verse 46, now it's interesting too. Let me go back, verse 45. When he arose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, but there's a, a qualifier here. Why are they asleep, according to the version in Luke? Because they were exhausted from sorrow, right? So that's what it says in Luke. That's why this group was apparently asleep there. And why were they in sorrow, right? Well, we know that when Jesus, uh, he is crucified and he dies and and then ultimately, when he's resurrected and he's left, uh, we know that all of the disciples there are staying in the upper room. They were afraid of the Pharisees. They were sorrowful because Jesus is gone, that sort of thing. So you can start to tie some of these things together, okay? And so what does he say to them? Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray. Why? Why? so that you will not fall into temptation. All right, so let's, fo let's follow this up then with the version in Mark, okay? Now, this is out of Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 42, okay? So let's read that. 
starting in verse 32, chapter 14 of Mark. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and in English, that means olive press, pressing and getting oil, right? That's the oil press. All right. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. Then verse 33, remember, there's little, when you come up, okay, remember this. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Now, you're going to find in several of the messages, as I take this little stop here, we find that in the circle of intimacy, and I've discussed that uh, several times, and I'm sure you've probably heard it, we've got the Apostle John is the closest, most intimate, had the most intimate place with Jesus. The second group was the three, Peter, James, and John, right? And then we had the rest of the 12. So you've got three groups, right? All right. So here, what's interesting, out of Mark, here we are alluding to that second group once again. Why? Because it says specifically that he took Peter, James, and John along with him to begin uh, to pray, all right? In verse 34, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, so they are at a place that's different from the, the, the 12, right? So the, or the 11, because Judas has gone to betray them, but you'd see what I'm saying. So you have the whole group of the disciples, and then they stop. Jesus then takes the three, the second group, to go along with them, and then they stop. Then he goes a little bit farther, right? Okay. So verse 35 again. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if it possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible to you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter. Now you notice here he's specifically addressing Peter. And he says, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? There's a rebuke. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise! Let us go! Here comes my betrayer. Now, here we get a whole lot more information out of this. Again, he speaks specifically and directly to Peter. And so what is he saying each, uh, each of these times? There's three instances. Wait a minute. Three instances that he goes to pray, comes back, goes to pray. And, and so you think like, wow, there's another three different times where he's coming back to the disciples, right? Or what it says in verse 41, returning the third time. Hmm. So think about that, right? All right. So uh, let's go then to the third group, the Matthew group. And that's out of Matthew chapter 26, excuse me. 
Matthew chapter 26, thank you, Abba, verses 36 through 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and began to be sorrowful and troubled. Now, here's an interesting little aside. You notice how it's different here. The sons of Zebedee, or the sons of thunder, are James and John. But you notice he doesn't call them that here. He calls them by uh, the, the, this other label, the sons of Zebedee. Uh, and, uh, and again, Peter as a separate one. And he said to them, my soul is over, but here's a, another point. Again, it's that three from the second group, but here we're highlighting Peter again as separate from the other two, you see? All right. My soul is overwhelmed to the sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Are you noticing a consistent thing about the watching folks? My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Listen to what we say here. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Again, we're talking to Peter. So it's the second time. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away for a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. That's, that's the flesh, folks. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Ding, ding, ding. Let's look at this. Look, the hour is near and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Now, again, we see so many other things uh, that, that, that we see here, uh, and, and, and I just want to highlight this out of this again. Multiple instances that are speaking directly to Peter, and this is to highlight the point that Peter, as the representative of the Jewish believers, and that is why this uh, passage out of the book of Matthew chapter 26 highlights yet even more the, the, the Jewishness and the fact that there's a specific uh, uh, what am I trying to say here? The, the specific point that Peter is found asleep more than one time, right? All right. And so here, overall, what my point is that there are three groups, once again, that are mentioned here. The groups out of the bride in Luke, the left behind church in Mark, and then the, the, the remnant Jewish believers that are uh, in Matthew, okay? If, if you look at it from that standpoint, yes, we st and you start to see, wait a minute, that starts to make more sense. You start to understand, oh, why is this not said over here? Why is this said in this manner and not over there? You start to see, the reason is because it's written to a different group, all right? I hope that you can see that. And we see so much out of the Garden of Gethsemane in those three separate rapture groups, okay? All right.
So, but am I finished there? No, no. We're going to talk now. I'm going to segue this into Pentecost. We're going to start talking about harvest times and seasons, right? We can see that there are various different groups, and we associate those three different groups with harvest, right? That's another way that we identify those groups based on the type of harvest and when that harvest takes place. And those three harvests are the barley harvest, the wheat harvest, and then the fruit harvest, okay? That's what I'm saying in, in this particular instance. We've got those three groups. Those are the same groups that are alluded to that we just read in the Garden of Gethsemane passage. And uh, it, 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 it's okay. Uh, I noticed that we're having some uh, interesting conversations over the other, other side. But let's just not let's not argue, folks, and let's just try to keep it. Not everyone has to agree. And what I did, but what I do find is that, as as a bit of a sidebar here, is that where we find the more vociferous pushback is from folks that will not, do not, and will not see it any other way. No, you're wrong. It's my way or the highway. And what I'm saying is there's no, no reason to argue with those folks at all. What it is, I believe, is another example, another uh, uh, a way that we can see a particular person that we might suspect belongs to a different group because if you are in the in the post tribulational harvest group the remnant jewish believer group the reason why i say that is they you cannot in general get them to see that there is a pre tribulation harvest no, all they can see is just post-tribulation everywhere. It's clear, you hear them say. The Bible says exactly this. Yeah, well, the Bible may say exactly that. But when you put all of the pieces together, you get a complete picture. Just because you want to take one passage out, and yes, it may say that, but it's relating to one particular group not to the other groups. That's what I'm saying. When you look at it from its context, you will see that if you are part of a different group. Are you following me? So uh, in general, we, we have a lot of uh, antagonism when it comes to those that hold to the post-tribulation group. Is there going to be a post-tribulation group? Yes. Do I believe that there are scriptures that point out that it says after the tribulation of those days, is this going to happen, that going to happen? Yes. But am I saying that's the only one? That's where I believe you are getting it wrong if you hold to that position because you are trying to discount and are discounting other big, huge parts of scripture throughout the Bible which show that there are other groups and they do not fall into that particular uh, uh, listing that the, the, the scriptures that support them don't uh, don't fall in the, the, the same. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is that there are specific scriptures that can only be associated with one particular group. You can't just apply them to everything because then that would be inaccurate, right? Okay, so that's what I'm saying. We, we want to hear the trumpet call of God. We are going to hear that, and I've said before too in another message that that trumpet sound is going to be heard by the whole world. They're going to hear something. Now, they might not hear it as we hear it. Uh, I encourage you, if you haven't seen my message on that, that's one of the handful of actual videos I've done 
rather than the uh, live streams, which I've been doing for quite some time now. Uh, so if you check that out, I think that you're going to uh, really, really be blessed by it and, and for it. Uh, be ready for what is about to take place. All right, now let's get back to this. There are, yes, uh, Brother Mike, uh, one Bible, many dispensations. They are, they are. And there, there is some that's written for a time. There is some that's written for a season. There are some that's written to a group. There is some that's written to an individual. And in fact, uh, when you start to personalize passages, verses of the Bible, I have actually been miraculously healed when I personalized a healing scripture that I then had my eyes opened and I, it, it was, wow, it was, it was really amazing. I was, and I'm not going to go into detail about how bad it was, but it was bad. Okay. I was really ill, very, very ill. But when I listened to this passage, I asked for it to be read to me. And suddenly my, my mind was opened. And, and I said, that scripture, that's for me. In that moment. And I said, I believe it. Brothers and sisters, in that instant, when that happened, that scripture passage uh, came alive to me. And in that moment, I really understood that that passage was written for me in this, in that moment. And in that instant, when I did that and I placed my belief in it, I was instantly, miraculously healed from, from very, very ill. And like I said, I won't go into detail. It was very bad to complete restoration in an instant. It was amazing. We had to actually call people over that had to transport me from the hospital because they could not believe it. They had to come and see it themselves. And they were amazed, shocked. My goodness, what happened to you, Wayne? And I was healed. That's what I'm at. That's what happened, right? The word came alive. The rhema word healed me. And it will heal you too. All right, let's go into this. Let's talk about Enoch and the Pentecost. So you, we've got three harvests, three harvests, the barley harvest, the wheat harvest, and the fruit harvest or the grape harvest. It depends on how you want to look at it. It's the same thing, right? That's what I'm saying. And those three groups equate to what we've been discussing throughout, and that is the bride, the left behind church, and the remnant of the Jewish remnant that's going to be harvested at the end. Are there any crossovers? Yes, is it, 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 there are gleanings that happen in those types of things. I'm just going to cover it from a higher level at this point, okay? So that we don't go too long and, uh, and so that I hit these points. So let me show you this. I got this from another site and it's about Enoch and Pentecost, okay? So you can take a screenshot of that. All right. All right, and so what I want to do is I want to discuss who Enoch is. Very simply, he was the first person who was ever raptured. And, uh, and so he was taken by God. It's discussed out of uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, and, and so I, we're not going to get into that. That's dealing with faith. However, what I want to discuss is about the symbol that Enoch represents for the Gentile bride of Christ that is going to be harvested and uh, or raptured. And so Enoch was the very first. Why? So it's another symbol, the very first in line. 
And so we see this, and as we look at the harvest, it's the very first harvest in time, in the year. It is the barley harvest. What is the second harvest? That is the wheat harvest. What is the harvest at the end of the year? That is the fruit harvest. That's what we're talking about. So in this particular instance, we want to discuss Enoch and Pentecost. Now, I want to highlight Pentecost because Pentecost is not what they have been saying Pentecost is. And that's why I'm pointing out about uh, uh, Dr. Barry, others, and, and, and I've been saying this myself, uh, and, and, but some tend to want to hold on to this, that, that Pentecost is the birth of the church, and that is, you know, 50 days after he uh, uh, was taken up to heaven, all right? When he ascended up to heaven, then 50 days later, and that's when they say it's Pentecost. It is not. It is a Pentecost. It is not the Pentecost where everyone is trying to tie it in. There is a mixing of, of them. And the reason for that is because they, they were like, oh, wait, when you look at it and you see three Pentecosts that are happening, Feast of Weeks, then at the end of 50 days, a Pentecost, then you have Shavuot. And then after another 50 days, right? You have the Feast of New Wine, which is the true Pentecost. That's what we're talking about. The giving of Holy Spirit on that particular day, that was the Feast of New Wine, not Shavuot, not the Feast of Weeks, not the 50 days afterwards, right? And then there's 50 days after that, and we have a Feast of New Oil, okay? There's the pressing of the oil, that gets back to the Garden of Gethsemane. I hope that you're starting to pull all these things together because there's so much. The word is so rich. All right. So Enoch, he's the first one raptured. Well, who's the second one? Do we have a second one? Yeah, we got Elijah, right? And so uh, we, we won't go into that. Uh, of course, uh, myself and, and Brother Mike, they're at Repo Man 64. We cover this, uh, I think, a lot uh, about how uh, Elijah and Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 2, representative of, which can also be taken in isolation there, as the first rapture and then the left behind church being uh, symbolized by Elisha. And, uh, and so go ahead and check out Brother Mike. He does a very good job of laying that all out well with his timeline which we are going to get into here in just a moment. All right, Enoch, there are several things that we get from this particular page, and that is Genesis 5, 24. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And what did he take him? That was a snatching away. That was a harpazo. That was a nutsal. That was a whatever word you are wanting to use to describe God actually physically taking someone from the earth alive so that he might not see death. And that is what the rapture by our definition is, okay? He's the seventh from Adam. We get that out of Jude 14. The first rapture, he was not for God took him. Now, this is interesting, a Jewish legend. Now, remember, I got this from someone else. And so this is where I'm going to kind of give my little twist or correction, as it were, or my point of view, as what it says. So the Jewish legend is that Enoch was born and raptured on the 6th of Sivan, which would become Shavuot, okay? That is the Feast of Weeks, and uh, that is the end of the barley harvest and the first fruits of the wheat harvest, which takes place afterwards. But you notice that he then has Shavuot hyphen, then Pentecost. So that's once again, another person that is equating Pentecost with Shavuot. It is a Pentecost, but it is not the Pentecost that we talk about in the book of Acts, where the giving of Holy Spirit happens and uh, at that moment, that is the Pentecost of new wine. 
Okay. All right. Then we have Enoch is prophesied about the Lord's coming. That's in Jude 14. All right. So let's let's get into this a little more because I want to highlight a couple of things from uh, Brother Mike that I uh, want to point out here. And so I, uh, I, I, I took this and let me just go ahead and give you a snapshot. When you uh, go to Brother Mike's, uh, uh, I believe it's at his Discord page, he has a full, excuse me, you can download his uh, full timeline. I've just taken a snippet here for the purpose of this. All right, so let's let's go ahead and let's see if you can get that clearly. I'm hoping that you can. Uh, well, this is a little, there we go, right there, okay? All right, so let me just highlight some things out of there if you, if you can see this. And what I'm wanting to focus on is, excuse me, one more time. And I think you want my, I want to focus on Ascension Day and Shavuot. Okay. Now, one of the things that I really love, Brother, uh, Brother Mike, in, in dealing with the day of equal parts and trying to determine where the first day of the year is and how all of the rest of the feast days will uh, fall in line from when we determine that day is. Uh, and, and we see then the first of Nisan is actually going to be on the uh, 17th of March. That's going to be the first day, right? All right. And whether you hold to some other view, just follow me for a second. I think that it's actually, I think that it has a lot of value, but I'm actually going to go farther with this. This is what I'm wanting to look at. So in this particular section, we can see that, uh, that Jesus rises from death uh, on Nisan 17, right? That that would be what it would be uh, from the Jewish calendar, Nisan 17, which we are uh, expecting based on this timeline to have been April the 2nd and 3rd. All right, let's just go down. So we see that uh, that was after three days and he rises and, uh, and that's the what's what I also want to highlight here is that is the first day that the ark rests and that is 153 days after Jesus rises from the dead right it's 153 days after excuse me not after he rises from the dead it's 153 days after uh, after the flood, right? So that's 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 what we're looking there. But that's 153 fish, 153 rapture fish, okay? And that's on that day. But I like the fact if we look at it, uh, some like uh, to look at other other different parts of this, the water recedes or the the ravens let out and and so on and so forth. And yes, all very relevant stuff but we can get so much out of all of it, right? And I think it's very interesting that it says on that day that the ark rested. That's a, a lot that we don't think about a lot, right? What does Jesus uh, or, or God say that he's going to do on the seventh day? He rested. And I'm, I'm thinking that that is... I think it's very interesting uh, that, and we can look at this again from the big picture perspective, that on this day, Jesus defeats death. The ark has rested, right? And, and so uh, 
when you look at it there, there's so much meaning. All right, so let's go on. And then we see, of course, there's uh, seven days uh, that, that pass. We have Jesus uh, being seen, not seen, whatever. Uh, we got Thomas in the upper room. He sees, uh, and then he believes. But then it says from that point that Jesus walked with them for 40 days, right? And so then Jesus ascends on Nisan the third, and that's on that based on that timeline is May 18th. Okay, that's on the 63rd day of the year based on that timeline for that particular start of the year. Now he says that stick around here, don't go anywhere. In uh, not many days, uh, there's going to be. Uh, the, this promise that you're going to get. So three days after Jesus ascends, what do we have? The Holy Spirit descending on Shavuot, Feast of Weeks. Now that's what he has here. But this is what I'm concerned with. I don't see that as being that case. This is where I have a slight difference. Not many days does not mean three. I, 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 what, what would we say normally? We would say, it was like, in a couple of days, this is going to happen. You're going to, uh, 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 what would we say otherwise? We, we would use other terms in a week or um, you know, a month from now or uh, we might say uh, they, they use this term fortnightly, which, which is every two weeks, something along those lines. You wouldn't use, I would think, the term not many days to mean that this was going to happen in three days. Uh, and uh, there are those that hold to that. I believe that was Shavuot. Yes. But I don't see the Holy Spirit as descending on that time. Follow me. Just follow me. All right. I think it's important to see, however, that it was Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And I think that that is very interesting as we've looked at that is May 21st. That's actually, oh, one, two, three, four. All right. That's what I'm looking at. My time just right at that moment. That's what I'm looking at. It keeps happening to me, folks. I mean, just like, wow. All right. Ugh. All right. Uh, so anyway, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And that is the uh, first part of this three-part harvest issue that I'm trying to raise. So let me highlight this and get a little closer because I, I want you to be able to see this. Uh, okay. I'm hoping that's going to be clear enough. All right. So uh, this is what we have here. Uh, the Shavuot Feast of Weeks, and that is what we're seeing three days after Jesus ascends. So we have the ascension, then we have Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Now, interestingly, when we look at that, we have Pentecost that happens 50 days later. There's another Pentecost. That's the Feast of New Wine that happens 50 days after Shavuot. Now, that is when I am saying, and others are saying, uh, that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the Feast of New Wine, and that's in line with what the scriptures are pointing out, that uh, those, those guys are drunk with new wine. Well, it's not new wine because it's, you know, it's, it, it's in the morning, and uh, so that sort of thing. That's what it all covers there. But what I want to do is to kind of cross this over with Dr. Barry as well. And so we can see how a lot of this ties together. Okay. And so Dr. Barry, let's see, I borrowed this particular one here. 
All right, so if you can get that. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to highlight at the top, which I think there, there's so much, Dr. Barry does so well and he's laid that all out and he's covers it so well, but I'm going to highlight the three harvests, right? All right, so you see there at the top and how he relates it. Uh, I believe I might sneeze, folks. I'm trying not to. <coughs> oh, excuse me. All right. Uh, there's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? That's a full week feast. Then we've got Shavuot, that's the Feast of Weeks, that's the wheat harvest. And then we've got Sukkot there at the end. We've got the uh, the oil, fruit. You see how that comes in there. He's got some dividing lines. And this is what I want to look at first. So we see the 117. Oh, my goodness. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen that as well as many of you. Uh, but I want to focus in on where we see Shavuot, third month, 15th day, okay? Now, do you see he's got that line that separates barley from wheat, okay? And this is what I'm, I'm wanting to, uh, to, to show is that why do we, why have we thought that Shavuot uh, is, has a picture of the rapture. Well, a lot of us have seen that, right? Let me just take a step back and say, why do we see raptures all over the place, right? When we go through this entire yearly timeline, you can see we were like, well, wait a minute. We, can, we, we, we have a, a rapture type at Passover. And we go, wait, wait, we have a rapture type, Shavuot. Oh, uh, wait, 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 we have a rapture type at Pentecost, Feast of New Wine, okay? We have a rapture type at uh, 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 Feast of Trumpets. We have a rapture type at uh, Hanukkah or Purim, or you see what I'm saying? Well, here's what I would say. Just highlighting the barley, the wheat, and the fruit, why do we have rapture types there? And I am submitting to you the reason why we have rapture types there is because there is a rapture there, okay? That's what I'm wanting to say is that overall, there's, there's three. There's not like 15 of them. I, at least uh, I don't believe so. Let's just focus on what we have here. And you notice that the barley season ends on Shavuot. That's the, the last of the counting of the Omer. That's the last of all of the harvesting of the barley. The barley wasn't all harvested at the beginning. The first fruits were, but they aren't. The reason why it's called first fruits is because that is the very first few stalks of the field that were ripe. What does that mean? The rest of it is not ripe, right? Or it will be ripe here in days. We're going to start getting ready to harvest this. It's at that time, right? All right. So it's if one is starting to get harvested or ready to harvest, then that means that instantly the rest of it's going to start being ready to harvest. So that's what we see in the counting of the Omer. And we see the harvesting that is going on. The harvesting is going on all the way up until the last day of this harvest, which is then we say barley harvest, excuse me, is complete. And then we have the first fruits of the wheat harvest, which will come next. So when does that happen? That happens on Shavuot, okay? And that's on three, the third month, 15th day. 
And so it's interesting. What I think is very interesting is that could that be what we keep hearing is that he's going to raise these certain people up on the last day. And we keep trying to figure out what day, what last day are we talking about? Last day of the week, last day of the month, last day of a feast, last day of the, you know, you know, last day of anything before it's all destroyed. There are a number of things that we see. And I'm thinking like, why don't we consider how about the last day of the barley harvest for the harvest of the uh, the bride, the barley harvest bride? Now, am I saying that that it kind of just like stamping it and saying like, thus says the Lord? Well, of course not. I wouldn't say that at all. But I think it's worth considering and uh, to be able to look at. And and anyone else, let's 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 just take a look at, it, consider it, and. And, and pray about it and see what the Lord is going to show you, okay? All right. Uh, then we have, then what starts is the wheat harvest. The wheat harvest starts. Now, remember, Jesus was, he's our first fruits of both the barley and the wheat, right? All right. And you notice, though, that we come all the way down to the Feast of New Wine, and that's where that's during the wheat harvest, right? That's that's almost the end of the wheat harvest, just by a couple of weeks. So, but what we see in that scenario, uh, people are looking at, and you see, well, wait a minute, that's when the church was born. Okay, I, I don't dispute that. I, I don't dispute that at all. I agree with that. Church was born on this new wine Pentecost. And that's when it started. And then you've got uh, then those that say, well, then uh, what's going to happen then is the church age would be closed on that day. I don't have a problem with that either. What I'm trying to uh, hopefully have you consider is that the bride comes out of the body. So the bride is part of the body, but it comes out of the body, right? So you have to have a body before you can have a part of it come out of it. Do you understand what I'm saying? But also the barley matures before the rest of the, the, the grains, right? It matures faster than wheat. So what I'm saying is, yeah, we, we have multiple fulfillments of things going on, all right? Uh, and uh, so what I'm saying is that the wheat is the second harvest. It is the greater harvest. It is what's talked about. It is the left behind church. It is the harvest that happens in the heat of the summer. It is the harvest that is run over by the tribulum from which we get tribulation. That is what happens to the wheat. That is not what happens to the barley. And the barley can, is going to, I still believe, still going to happen uh, before the wheat harvest. Now, Dr. Barry seems to think that, you know, this could happen on the Feast of New Wine or the actual Pentecost. And what I'm saying is, I also believe that that could happen for the second harvest, that that might be when the second harvest could take place, right? But I still, uh, I'm still holding on to the barley being the first harvest. So that's where we're going from there. And I hope that you can, can see that, at least consider it. Um, Here's the one thing I would say about that overall. This is not a salvation issue, folks. And, and so we are working through this. We are looking at it. And I'm just wanting to look at this from the standpoint of being encouraged uh, that this can happen at any moment. I really believe that that's the case. 
And when I say any moment, that is taking into account that there are appointments, right? Uh, that, that God did have an appointed time for each of these harvests to take place. So I'm not saying it in that particular sense. I'm saying from that particular uh, sense that we are that close. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying we are that close. Now, the other things are, so is that going to happen on, uh, well, when do we see Shavuot? Is that going to be on uh, May 21st? Is that going to be on May 22nd? Uh, or is that going to be, like uh, Dr. Barry points out, going to be on June 3rd slash 4th? And so uh, in any of those instances, what I'm trying to say is this is definitely that high watch time where we still want to keep this in mind. So am I saying it's any one of those? Mm, no, I, I'm not, but I am saying that it can be any one of those and that it is definitely worth keeping the eye on. If you believe that we, that, that 2023 is, you know, man, it looks so much like the year that there are just too much to say that we can't just go to 2024 without the, uh, the rapture of the bride taking place then where can we look at it? Where can we see it fit in the scheme of things? And here is what I'm trying to say. We've got three harvests. We've got the barley harvest, the wheat harvest, and we've got the fruit harvest or the grape harvest. And we have to have it, I believe, happen in that order because of just too many other things that we see. And I'm thinking that we need to hold on right now. When you can't lose hope. You can't give up. And, and, and so let's talk about that for just a moment. Giving up hope. I have a real concern with those that are looking only for a date instead of looking for Jesus. And, uh, and, and let me tell you why, because it's my feeling that if what you are really saying is that I don't have time to listen to all of this and your video is too long, just give me a date. And uh, so what I get from that particular type of approach is that I'm too busy with the world and doing all my worldly things, but that's okay. If you can give me a date and a date that I can depend on, then uh, 10 minutes before then, I can go ahead and say, all right, uh, let's go ahead and turn toward Jesus. I'm ready to go now. And that's not a heart that is turned towards Jesus in my mind. Okay. He's wanting, and I think that we see from everything that he is doing in and among people, all over the world and his idea that saying to be ready, he's not saying be ready now. Could he have not just said, uh, you know, like, be ready in two months, 13 days and you know, and just uh, on this particular hour. Yes, he could do that. And I believe he will do that, but he's only going to give a short very short window for when he says this is going to happen. And he's only going to talk to those. He's only going to tell those who are watching like the watchers are. We, we, we test a particular time. We're looking at a particular time. And at the same time, we, uh, uh, we are, uh, I'm saying, uh-oh, video froze. We should be okay. Uh, let's, let's just say, okay, let me, let me shut this down. And I'm just saying that we are looking for Jesus to open up in the air. And I am just saying, brothers and sisters, be ready, ready, be ready because he's about to call us up.
And if you don't know that Jesus and you want to know that Jesus, as I said earlier today, then all you have to do is find a place and, and believe that this Jesus, God manifest in the flesh, who died for your sins, my sins, and everybody's sins on this entire world. And he was buried and he rose again after the third day. And if you place your complete trust in that finished work that he did on the cross to pay that sin debt that you could not pay, and you accept it as a free gift, saying, come into my heart, Jesus, cleanse me, make me whole, be my Lord and Savior, and you have done that, then I congratulate you. I thank you. I welcome you to the family, and I look forward to seeing you in the clouds. God bless you, brothers and sisters, Maranatha, and I will see you soon. Jesus is about to call us up.